I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, 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 hello. Hello, 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 How are you today? I'm just fine. How are you? Oh, I'm just fine, too. Oh, well, that's nice. Tell me, how is the new baby? Oh, you mean my friend, Mr. Hank Founds? Yes, yes. Oh, the baby's just fine. She's very happy, and she's a good baby. Can she pronounce her name yet? No, she can't pronounce it yet. I made a little rhyme up about the baby. You did? Well, let's hear it. All right. There was a baby, and it was small. The father was Hank, and he was tall. The doctor said the baby was Hank's, so he turned to his wife and said to her, thanks. Well, that's a very good little poem, and it's very funny, too. Yes, thank you. Now, would you please read me the funny? Puck the Comic Weekly? Mm -hmm. Very well, I'll read that in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page, hop along, Cassidy. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Six guns blazing as he thunders along. Give us music for Hop Along. There's been an outburst of robberies, holdups, and crimes around the town of Buckskin. They've all been committed by a man called the Chameleon because he changes his disguise for each holdup. Hoppy had trailed the chameleon into the desert where his horse was stolen from him at a water hole. After hours under the sun with nothing to drink, Hoppy has fallen unconscious where he was found by the gang of outlaws. He was taken to a place called Terrespiri Verde. There he escaped from a place where he was locked up. While investigating, he slipped into a room of the hotel there from the balcony where a beautiful girl holds a knife at his back. At that moment, the door opens and a waiter steps in. He says, Hey, Chiquita, the patrons grow impatient for your songs. Eh, who is this hombre? She tells him how she caught Hoppy when he slipped in from the balcony. Last picture, top row, the waiter, whose name is Manuel, searches Hoppy. Hoppy says, Now look, just, I'm only trying to escape from enemies who found me unconscious in the desert and brought me to Terrestre Verde. Manuel finds a strange coin on Hoppy. Holding it up, first picture, second row, he says, Hey, this ancient Aztec coin. Where did you get it, huh? Why, the Texas Rangers think somebody called the chameleon knows something about it. Maybe I've come to return it to him. Ah, it is a symbol of evil. Those who carry it are not welcome here. Take your coin and get out. Yeah, but why? I don't understand. Chiquita's face hardens. She tells Hoppy the door is behind him and to get out. There's nothing else to do. Hoppy shrugs, turns, and goes out. As he crosses the balcony, last picture, second row, he hears voices. Hey, hey, look! Hey, catch you! Men from the gang of outlaws dash up the steps of the balcony after him. First picture, bottom row. Quickly, Hoppy dives over the balcony for the chandelier below. He catches it, and as it swishes through the air under the impact of his body, the candles go out, and Hoppy drops to the floor and heads for the door. In the semi-darkness, someone grabs his arm and leads him outside. Outside, last picture, Hoppy looks at his unknown friend and exclaims, Chiquita. Quickly, Chiquita whispers that Hoppy's enemies are hers and that their enemy works for the chameleon. And then she adds, follow me and I will show you the way to his hideout. Oh, hooray, hooray. Hoppy escaped. <laughs> yes, yes, well, Hoppy what, escaped. Wasn't it strange that the, that girl first told him to get out of her room and now she's going to help him? Well, that was because she didn't trust anybody at that place. Oh. Oh, she's smart, isn't she? Mm -hmm. uh, how, how do you think Hoppy will catch the chameleon? Well, we'll find that out next week. Now? Oh, and now could we please turn over the page because I'm sure Prince Diane is there. All right, over the page we go. And you're right. He's surely here. And remember last week when they were lost in the wilderness? They, they started on their way home. And as they came around a bend of the river, they were swept into wild waters and lost their supplies and were finally thrown up on shore in a very badly damaged canoe. Isn't that terrible after all that hard work? Yes, you bet it is. Well, let's see how they make out. Here we go with Prince Valiant to the days of King Arthur. Eckert, Brackett, Gray, Mulkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. <laughs> Prince
Prince Valiant and Arf awake to a stormy dawn and find they've come ashore on an island where the river widens into a lake. Their boat has been badly damaged and will need much repairing. As Val inspects the canoe, Arf takes a spear, climbs on a rock on the river to try to spear breakfast. The water's so rough that Arf cannot lure a fish within reach of his spear. He makes his way to shore without any luck and sits down to rest. There he drops to the ground. Val cheers him by saying, Well, I was getting rather tired of fish, Arf. But after two days of nothing but berries and green nuts, I'd welcome some nice trout. Well, worst comes to worst, I might even try a roast of young squire. On the third day, the storm passes. In the sunset calm, first picture, second row, Val waits near a sheltered cove where the breeze is offshore. Soon a deer comes down to feed on the lush water weeds. Last picture, second row, Val slips into the water. With infinite caution, he glides forward while the animal has its head in the water feeding. Then, first picture, bottom row, Val slips forward, only a few steps at a time, for he must pause before his prey raises its head to gaze about so there'll be no telltale ripples to warn of danger. And then, when he is near enough, carefully he grasps the bow in the hunter's grip, knocks an arrow, and takes the bowspring in what is known as the Turkish release... And when next the deer lowers its head, he surges forward quickly to point-blank range. And that night, last picture, Val and Arf dine on meat for the first time in many days. They sit comfortably beside the warm fire, enjoying a delicious meal together, thanks to a passing deer. so quietly into the water with the rushes on his head so he looked like something growing in the water and he was so quiet. Yes, he certainly is a wonderful hunter. Yes, he certainly is a wonderful hunter. Well, now that they have more food and the canoe is repaired and the storm has gone down, I'm sure he'll start for home next week. I hope he doesn't have any more trouble. So do I. Now I'm sure that you want to read Donald Duck. Oh, you were never so sure of anything in your life. Very well, turn over the page and there on page five is Donald Duck. Say the magic words with me. Squee, jump, jump squee, jump, jump, jump squeely, chicken track. track. Let's, Let's have, have music to fit a quack, quack. Today, Donald's nephews, Louie, Dewey, and Huey, are up in the attic tying three bicycles to a rope. They lower them to the ground and then climb on. Huey, Louie, and then Dewey's in the saddle. All right, let's go, fellas. We haven't much time. And away they go, down the road. Last picture, top row, Dewey says, Boy, they sure seem sturdy. First picture, bottom row, they grind up a hill. Dewey says, Hey, not bad on hills. They start going down the other side. Huey yells, Hey, how's your coaster break? I don't know yet. I'm only doing 50. A short time later, they arrive back home. There they stop. They tie the ropes to the bicycles. Okay, hoist away. And they haul the bicycles up to the attic again. Next day, last picture, as they come down for breakfast, Donald stands proudly in the living room besides the three bicycles, which he has bought for his nephew's birthday present. The boys look at the bikes, which are the very ones, of course, they've been riding the day before, and they say, Wow! Hey, what a keen surprise! Yeah, bicycles for our birthday! Donald looks so proud, (laughs) as though he's doing something very unusual. Yes, and the boys pretended they didn't know anything at all about the bicycle. (laughs) And here they knew all about it, and they had already tried them out by sneaking them out of the attic. (laughs) Oh, those kids, they are a caution. Oh, and they are funny, too. (laughs) Well, now let's go over the page to the very last page of the first section. The last page of the first section, because I'm sure you want to see what happens to Rusty Riley. Oh, yes. Rusty was locked up by those crooks, 
And since since Dick isn't in any danger today, I'll read him by myself later. All right. I'm anxious to see if Rusty gets free. Good. Now, remember the crooks had kidnapped Rusty and Pete. Yes, and, and that was because the boys had trailed him to that old abandoned house. And now Rusty and Pete are locked in an old cave while the crooks go back to get their loot. Well, I hope the boys will get out because, you remember, they'd found the valuables and then they hid them in a different place in the cellar. And if the crooks don't find that stuff, they're sure to know that Rusty and Pete did find the stuff and they might come back and hurt the boys. Yes, that's right. Well, let's read right now and see what happens. Here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. Locked in the cave, the boys try to figure out how they might escape. Rusty says, hey, Golly, Pete, they've really locked us in this cave. Do you, you think we could crash through the door with your car? Pete replies, No, not a chance, Rusty. The doors are oak, they're two inches thick, and a steel bar across both of them. But believe me, I don't intend to sit here and wait for somebody to let us out. Maybe nobody will come around here till spring. Yeah, but Rusty, those crooks said they'd tell the police we're here after they go back and get the horse show trophies. Rusty says, last picture top row. I know they said that, Pete, but don't forget, we dropped the trophies in that old cistern. They won't give us a thought till they find them. No, we got to find a way out ourselves. Well, that isn't going to be too easy, Rusty. There's a, there's a little light right at this spot on account of the ventilator over the entrance, but, but it'll be pitch black further in. First picture, bottom row. Rusty thinks. And then he says, Hey, I suppose in summer when these caverns are open to tourists, they have electric lights, but, well, they'd be shut off now. Oh, sure, Rusty. Most likely there's a master switch out in that office shack outside where... I mean... Hey, wait a minute. The electric lights. That, that, that gives me an idea. Pete jumps to his feet and opens the hood of his car. Hey, come on, Rusty. Help me get the battery out of this car. We'll take off one headlight, and we'll have a portable light plant. Hey, jeepers, Pete. That's a swell idea. <laughs> Meanwhile, at police headquarters, Tech Centers. Oh, howdy, Inspector. I just dropped in to see if you turned up anything in the missing boys. The detective replies... Oh, uh, good morning, Tex. Uh, no, no, not a trace. But they must be holed up somewhere in the county because we, we have men on every highway and they haven't seen hide nor harem. Last picture, Tex looks at a folder that has just been handed to the detective. Hey, uh, what's that notice this sergeant just gave you? Is it about the boys? Oh, no, 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 Tex. Uh, sorry, it's just an FBI flyer about a couple of swindlers known as the Duke and Limey Joe. They're supposed to be operating in this territory. <laughs> picture of those two crooks because the Duke and Limey Joe are Sir Percival and Nobbs, and they're the same men that locked Rusty and Pete out. I'll bet you you're right, and if there is a picture of them, Tex will recognize them all right. And then they'll catch those crooks and make them tell where Rusty and Pete are, and then the boys will be safe again. Well, we'll find out about this next week. Now let's pick up the first page of the second section. Oh, there's Dagwood and Blondie. And I'll read that in just a moment, but first here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page of the second section, Dagwood and Blondie. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Ramafoo, ramafum, zim, zim, zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> Today, Dagwood and an errand boy come in the house carrying several cartons of groceries. They drop them on the floor. Dagwood says, Hey, look, dear. I got all these canned goods at wholesale price. Peaches, tomatoes, peas, and corn. Blondie clasps her hands in joy and exclaims, Oh, how wonderful. Enough to last us for months and months. And last picture top row, she begins to examine them. Oh, let's see. String beans, sauerkraut, mushrooms, apricots, pears, beans, beef. Now, I'll put some extra shelves in the cellar to store all these cans. <laughs> First picture, second row. Dagwood and Blondie are in the basement getting some lumber out. Dagwood looks at a blank wall and says, Yeah, this is a good place for shelves. Well, that's the doorbell. You better go up and see who's at it. <laughs> it's a friend of Blondie's who has two little children. As she settles herself in a chair, Blondie's friend says, Well, I was just in the neighborhood with the children, so I thought I'd drop in for a chat. Oh, well, I'll see if I can't find something to amuse the children while we chat. So Blondie takes the children in the other room and hands them some of the cans. Last picture, second row. Now, here's just the thing for you to play with. You can build a beautiful castle. 
castle with all these cans. And she goes into the other room for a nice visit. The kids start playing with the cans. One says, first picture, third row. Hey, the castle will look better if we take all the labels off. So they start to rip the labels off the cans. <laughs> A little later, Blondie dashes down to the basement and shrieks. Dagwood, come up quick. Something terrible's happened. Dagwood drops the hammer and the two of them shoot upstairs. Last picture, third row, Blondie points at the kids in the kitchen surrounded by shining cans. They tore all the labels off the cans. How can we tell what's in them? Dagwood goes. Blondie picks up one can and shakes it. First picture, bottom row. You can't tell what's in them by shaking them. Dagwood lights a candle, holds it on the other side of the can. I'm trying to x-ray him, but you can't see through the tin. And then Blondie and Dag would drop to the floor and start to cry. Oh, we won't know what we're going to eat for the next six months. Last picture, Blondie's friend goes out of the house, leading her two children. Come, darlings, let's go. I can't stand to see grown-ups cry. <laughs> That woman was very nice because her children caused all that trouble. And then she says when she's going away, she can't stand grown-ups crying. Yes, I think that's a very funny family. I would say they are a strange family. Dagwood's is a funny family. Yes, yes, you're so right. Oh, now, look under Dagwood and Bonnie. There's Roy Rogers. Oh, yes, and believe me, Roy has got himself in a mess of trouble with the crooks at the lumber camp. You remember last week he was knocked on the head and then he fell on the skidway into the river? Yes, Roy disappeared under the water just before the log hit. Let's read now and see if Roy's escaped. Here we go with Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. A yip I o Now here we go with Roy and Trigger. A yip I o Log goes down the skidway and hits the water with a terrific splash. For a moment, the water churns about. The log comes to the surface, and then Roy comes up, shakes his head. Oh, that was a narrow escape. If I hadn't gone to the bottom before that log hit the water, it could have torn my head off. He grabs onto the end of the log. I'll rest a minute before striking out for shore. At the end of the log, he sees a strange marking. That's funny. A diamond brand. <laughs> At that moment, Aunt Pauline, the owner of the logging camp, gallops up. She sees Wildwood throwing a rope to Roy. Wildwood quickly tells her what happened as they draw Roy to shore. Last picture, top row. As Pauline grumbles at Roy for the trouble he got himself into, Roy points out the brand at the end of the log. First picture, bottom row, he says, Well, in my business, if a triangle brand has worked over to look like a diamond, it means rustlers. And Pauline exclaims, yeah, in my business, it means log pirates. Mount up. We got to find that old tree worshiper, Cosmo, and make him talk. Meanwhile, old Cosmo, the old-timer who caused Roy all the trouble, is on his way to report to Ed Sneed, who put him up to his dirty work. Yeah, Ed Sneed's trail leads to this deserted logging camp, Fern. I hate all loggers for destroying the forest... But I am a fear of that timber cruiser. And we gotta be careful. He sees Etch working over some logs, making a diamond brand out of a triangle brand with a log mark. Uh, howdy, Etch. I obeyed your orders. Uh, I got rid of Rogers. Hey, you're changing the brand in them logs, ain't you? Hey, that, that, that's pirating. Etch slowly stands up and snarls. You got sharp eyes. And a big mouth, Cosmo. Last picture, Cosmo says. So this is how you hornswoggle the bunion outfit. Suddenly, Etch sleeps at him. Well, you ain't the first to find out, but you won't tell anybody about it. I'll see to that. Ah. Oh, that Etch Sneed is cruel. Is he going to kill Cosmo? Well, he says he's going to fix it so old Cosmo can't tell anyone that he just saw Etch changing the brand on those logs. Well, and what he just saw is the very thing that Pauline and Roy want to question him about. That's right. And if Etch Sneed kills Cosmo, then Pauline and Roy can't question Cosmo. And then they won't find out that Etch is the man behind all the trouble. And just think, Etch Sneed is working for Aunt Pauline and she trusts him. Which means he'll be in the position to continue his dirty work without being suspected. Unless Roy, who's very smart, finds out about it. Yeah, maybe. But we'll find out more about that next week. Now let's go over the page. All right. 
Oh, look, fresh Gordon. And remember, a very strange thing has happened to the Earth. It's completely covered with snow and ice. Yes, that's because the sun's rays have been cut off from the Earth. And when the sun doesn't shine, the world becomes cold and covered with ice. And Flash thinks someone has been causing this to happen. And he's gone on an expedition with Icy Stark, who doesn't want him to discover this. And they landed someplace like the North Pole, and they met some huge men. And just when they were about to shoot Flash, Flash fired first. And I'm anxious to find out who they are. All right, let's read now and see. Here we go with Flash Gordon. Orega, orega, doon, doon, saskimatash. Let's have music for Heroic Flash. The giants are only stunned by Flash's shot. And by the time they recover consciousness, Flash has them bound hand and foot. Quizzing his captives by sign language and symbols drawn in the Arctic snow, Flash learns that the giants came from Rhea. Saturn's fifth moon. Flash knows that Rhea is bitterly cold, and he quickly guesses that its inhabitants are creating this new ice age so they can colonize the Earth. Setting out on a swift scouting trip, Flash finds a hidden jet sled. He tells Dale, Listen, Dale, we've got to locate their main camp. I'll hide in the sled while you go back and let one Saturnian escape. He'll head for his camp, and I'll tell you by mini radio how to follow. Following Flash's orders, Dale frees one of the Saturnians. But when she tells Icy Stark, last picture top row, what she's done, the expedition chief is furious. You and Gordon are a pair of blundering meddlers. Your friend got himself into this jam, now let him get himself out of it. We're blasting off at once to make tests at the magnetic pole. bottom row, just as Flash expected. The escaped Saturnian hurries to his jet sled and takes off, unaware that an Earthman is stowed away aboard. The giant heads his craft straight for the Saturnian headquarters in the Arctic. As the snow car speeds over the ice packs, Flash whispers instructions into the mini-radio. He has no inkling of his peril now that Dale and Stark have rocketed beyond the range of his tiny transmitter. And last picture, plunging into a vast cavern at the base of a glacier. The jet sled reaches the hidden power plant where men from Saturn use their secret electronic science to turn Earth into an icy wasteland in which only they can survive. Ooh, what will happen to Flash now? He's alone among all those giants, especially if they find him. Well, he'll certainly be in trouble. And it's going to be hard for him to be hidden all the time. He'll get hungry. Sometimes. You think of everything, don't you? Well, I worry. And I don't blame you. That icy Stark certainly causes Flash plenty of trouble. Wouldn't it be wonderful if Flash destroyed that machine that's causing the Earth to be cold? It certainly would. But well, we'll find that out next week. Now, look across the page. Oh, my favorite, favorite, Uncle Remus. And his tails of Brer Rabbit. So say the magic words with me. Hippity-hoppity, hippity, make, make it a, a habit, habit to give us music for old Brer Rabbit. rabbit. <laughs> Uncle Remus says, Sometimes Brer Rabbit is hard-headed, and sometimes uh, not hard-headed enough. Brer Rabbit has gone for a walk. He comes to a fence where he sees several signs. One of them reads, Keep out. Private property. No trespassing. He climbs over the fence and he starts to pick flowers. Now Brer Ram, who owns the property, comes along. He sees Br'er Rabbit and says, ah, Br'er Rabbit, can't you read signs? Ah, who believes in signs, Br'er Ram? Br'er Ram lowers his head and he bleats, ah, When I says something, I means what I says. <laughs> and Br'er Rabbit whirls out of the patch and lands with a... right in front of a sign. Keep out. Last picture top row, Br'er Rabbit's at home. He's emptying his coal bucket. And he says, I is going to show Br'er Ram I can use my head, too. First picture bottom row, he's at Br'er Ram's property again. He looks at the sign which reads, Uh-uh, keep out. And he says to the sign, Yeah. And he puts the coal bucket over his head and climbs over the fence saying, 
eye is going to knock some common sense into a biggity head. Brer Ram sees him coming and lowers his head. Brer Rabbit lowers his head with a coal bucket helmet on it, and they gallop for each other. <laughs> and somebody sails over the fence and lands in front of a sign. Keep out. It's Brer Rabbit with his head aching, and his coal bucket helmet has been busted to pieces. Brer Ram looks at him and he asks, eh? You believe in signs now, Brer Rabbit? And Brer Rabbit sighs. I concede the argument, Brer Ram. And Uncle Remus says, If at first you don't succeed, uh, try something else. Oh, dear. That was one time Brer Rabbit wasn't as bright as he is to be. No, sometimes when we get some stubbornness, we crowd all the brightness out of our brains. It certainly happened to Brer Rabbit, and I'm sorry to say Brer Rabbit was wrong. Yes, he had no business picking Brer Ram's flowers without asking if he could. No. Well, I'm sure he won't do a thing like that again because he's really nice. Yes, he's really nice. Well, now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I gotta go now. All right, Mr. Tommy Wiggly Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date, and a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. 